It's just another Saturday morning. You're mowing your grass. And that's when you see someone standing next to your neighbor's car. It doesn't look familiar. But then you look closer. This man's stealing your neighbor's car. Now you have three options. Do you A, confront the man, B, call 911, or C, do nothing? If you picked A, then you might be a lot like Emiliano Zapata, who fought against the government that was full of corruption, gave back the lands that were stolen from the farmer, and was a fighter for the people. But this decision would cost him his life. Nothing was more valuable than land in South Mexico. There was so little of it that it was unusable. And what land was farmed kept getting taken away by the haciendas, the one percenters of their time, close friends with President Diaz, who made sure they were the richest people in Mexico. In order to do that, they would steal land from the farmers and begin to profit from it. Farmers and the peasants would protest outside government buildings. One of these activists was Emiliano Zapata. A young man who had followed in his father's footsteps as a horse trainer became one of the best in his trade throughout the state. Zapata wasn't a farmer or a peasant, but he wasn't filthy rich either. He did, however, have a mustache wax collection that would cost a fortune. Zapata would get involved in activist groups and join the protest when he was younger. After coming home and seeing his father weeping at the table, his father had explained the haciendas had taken their orchard and built a fence around. Around it. Now Zapata is one of the biggest supporters of the protest, paying for lawyers to defend the farmers. He even got involved in politics and tried to help. But one year later, Zapata would give up more than just his time and money. A lawyer and a group of farmers are heading to Mexico City to have a face-to-face -face meeting with President Diaz. The plan was to discuss the land that was stolen from the farmers by the haciendas. President Diaz would listen to their plea and told them he would look into it. And as the farmers left the building, the other supporters cheered when they heard the good news. It wasn't much, but it was an improvement prior to this case. They were finally making a step closer to justice. As the lawyer finished up in the palace and he made his way outside to celebrate this small victory, President Diaz would order the federal army to hang him in front of the crowd. This newly found hope of justice is now dangling before their eyes, struggling to stay alive. And when the news arrived back in Morelos, Zapata filled with anger, spoke up and convinced the farmers and the peasants of the village to take arms and fight for their land. Eighty men saddled up on their horses and they rode to the nearby farm that had recently been taken by the haciendas. They tore down the fence and they reclaimed the land back to the original owner. Francisco Madero recently lost an election after running against President Diaz. Madero would claim it was a fraudulent election and flee to Texas, where now he assembles an army of supporters and declares a revolution in Mexico. Although Madero already has a law large army of supporters, he knows he will need additional support from the South. Zapata, who has now assembled the Liberation Army of the South, has built a reputation for attacking haciendas and taking back the land. Madero reaches out to Zapata several times, asking him to join their cause. Emiliano refuses each time until Madero makes a face-to-face -face meeting with Zapata. They sit and they discuss what it would take to get Zapata to join. He replies that if Madero is willing to implement land reform policies when placed in power, he would fight for the revolution. So Madero agrees. But now Zapata will risk his life in the city of Cuauhtá. Zapata approaches Cuauhtá with an army of over 4,000 men. Now these men are not well-trained or experienced fighters. No, not at all. They are farmers and they are peasants and they believe in Zapata. Their success thus far has been because of their speed and agility on horseback. Charging the federal army in open fields before they can get the heavy machine guns firing, quickly killing the men with their machetes. Now they surround a city, one of the most guarded cities in the state. 
The regiment inside is the Golden Fifth. 500 of the most elite and well-trained soldiers who have never lost a battle look down from the walls at the 4,000 volunteer fighters. Heavy machine guns line the walls, ready to shower the field with brass casing. Zapata is unsure of how he's going to breach the walls until he sees an opportunity on the west side of the city. The aqueducts lead into the city. This is his shot. As he leads his men to the attack, the machine guns begin firing down on them. 300 men were killed before they could reach the aqueducts. On day two, Zapata cuts off the water supply, reducing the available resources within the city. On day three, Zapata orders his men to fill the aqueducts with gasoline. And as the gasoline flows into the city, they set the gas on fire, burning the troops alive. Now breaching the city from the west, the Zapatistas have made it inside the city. The close combat leaves the heavy machine guns useless. Now fighting with machetes, and bayonets, the rest of the Liberation Army advances. The elite 500 men will hold off for another three more days, waiting for reinforcements to arrive. Unfortunately, on the sixth day, no reinforcements arrive, and Zapata and his army now control the city. Thank you guys so much for watching, and if you like this, go ahead and check out these other two videos, and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you guys so much for your support. I couldn't do it without you. I will see you again next week for another episode of Beard History.